bases all over England during the Second World War, there were 50,000 Canadians serving in the campaign to bomb Germany. The odds facing the air crews were catastrophic. Only one in three would survive. This base at Tolthorpe in Yorkshire was used by Canadians. Now an abandoned ruin, it's covered with the graffiti of visiting Canadian veterans. Men stubbornly determined to leave at least some trace that their countrymen lived and died here. Canadian pilots remember thundering down these runways in bombers fully loaded with gasoline and explosives. Doug Harvey of Perth, Ontario, flew 30 missions over Germany as a bomber pilot. A lot of these trees, of course, were never here during wartime no, days. No, them were. Ken Brown of White Rock, British Columbia, was a pilot with the famous Dam Buster Squadron. The CO would never approve. No. Both often came within inches of death, and yet coming back here to remember, they savor the recollection of small things. Hey, look at this. Rose hips. Oh, there's quite a load of them yeah. there. Yeah. yeah. They weren't there during the war time. They weren't? We'd no. Be, we'd we'd be be eating them. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Vitamin C. You know Anything what? that was edible, we ate. Well, yeah. You know the vitamin C, where, where we got ours? Brussels sprouts, so oh I see. Yeah. That stuff that they yeah. used to call bubble and squeak also. Yeah. Doug Harvey was 19 years old when he joined the Air Force. Ken Brown was 20. This was the crew of bomber W for Willie from Air Base Leeming. Its tail gunner was Jim Moffat. I never thought I would survive. Right from the start, I told myself I was going to die. After that, it didn't bother me. Smitty, uh -huh. Smitty. Before he joined the Royal Canadian Air Force, Jim Moffat was a gold miner in Timmins, Ontario. We were all so damn young, almost 18 or 19 years old. I was one of the old men in the squadron. I was 21. You had lots of pals, but very few really good friends. Guys just disappeared too fast. We'd sing and joke about the flak and the searchlights, the things that scared the hell out of us when we were flying, you know. But for a lot of us, too, it was a game. Laughing at death and dropping your bombs on one little bastard. Absent friends. Absent friends. Do your glasses full, boys. Raise your glasses high. Here's the dead already, and here's the next to die. The British High Command knew how few bomber crews would survive, but deliberately hid the truth. That's not all that was concealed. Crews and the public were told that the bombing targets were German factories and military installations. In fact, in 1942, a secret plan was adopted. Germany would be crushed through the deliberate annihilation of its civilians. Few airmen would ever learn of that plan. They had joined to save democracy, hearing the words of the Canadian Air Force poet. Oh, I have slipped the surly bombs of Earth, reached out, touch the face of God. Canada's war artists captured the idealism and determination of the young men who went off to war, and the horror they braved every night in the skies over Germany. Many Canadians were sustained by a powerful sense of honor and duty to their country, 
men like Joseph Favreau of Montreal. My family came to Canada in 1665 and we were soldiers. I wasn't too happy with what the Germans were doing in Europe, I joined, and I was glad to defend my country. A lot of my friends said this wasn't our war. How could they say that when German submarines were sinking ships in the St. Lawrence River? In a war, it's the family and the land. You have to save those two. With a land, you have a family, and with a family, you have a country. Canada volunteered to be both an arsenal and a massive training depot for Bomber Command. It was called the Aerodrome of Democracy. Between 1940 and 1945, Canada would train 137,000 aircrew, more than England and all the rest of the Commonwealth combined. The volunteers came from the farthest reaches of the British Empire, from all over Europe and from the United States. The men arrived untrained but enthusiastic. The first time we'd ever met all these guys from the Yukon, guys from Newfoundland, guys from the West and the Prairie Boys, and. Uh, all the Americans that came up to join the Canadian Air Force, the, uh, the Texans were there with their boots on and uh, big hats. And it was just a, a thrilling time to get thrown in with all these people. And the Air Force, of course, with the elite, you know, the real cream boys. They were the guys with the white scarf, the Battle of Britain. And that's the outfit we were joining with the same spirit and the same dash. The young men who signed up with Bomber Command saw themselves as avenging angels. In 1940, German bombers were laying waste to the city of London in the siege that became known as the Blitz. 40,000 British civilians were killed. Churchill decided that responding with even more devastating attacks against German cities was his only way to win the war. Bomber Command's new chief, Arthur Harris, was given the task. Air crews called him the Butcher. There are a lot of people who say that bombing cannot win the war. My response is, it has not been tried yet. We shall see. This promised to be a new kind of warfare. No more wretched, muddy trenches like the First World War. In the Air Force, you could drop your bombs on Germany and come right back to drink and be merry in British pubs. What's more, in the Air Force, women served on the same basis as men. There were 150,000 in the Women's Auxiliary Air Force, mostly British. Mary Moore joined up in London. I heard one of my father's friends say, we shot down 20 today and only lost six. As if it was a cricket match. Just numbers, not men dying. I got so furious about that. So I joined the Women's Auxiliary Air Force. First I learned photographic interpretation for bombing and then I was posted to interrogate pilots after they came back. 425 Squadron. Canadians. As I got out of the car arriving, I got the most gorgeous wolf whistle from somebody and I thought, ha, <laughs> this is going to be all right. <laughs> Canadians in Britain were boisterous and noisy and fun-loving. Qualities that did not endear them to their British superiors. Canadians had a reputation stemming from the First World War of being fiercely independent, sometimes to the point of insubordination. Some British commanding officers were determined to break that spirit from the moment the Canadians stepped off the boat. We got a a talk from the CO, a, a real Brit, RAF type, who uh, said things like, uh, now we know you're all like the, uh, the Red Indians, the savages, you Canadians, but you aren't gonna have any of your, do any of your antics over here. And I want you to know, that the first guy gets out of line, is for it. The colonial attitude of British officers came from the top. I have been amused to read in almost every history or novel about empire wars 
what magnificent horsemen and natural good shots the colonial troops were. I have ridden with colonial troops and shot with colonial troops and been shot at by colonial troops. And I have no hesitation in saying that colonial and dominion troops are on the average damned bad horsemen and damned bad shots. Canadians were facing adversity and death together and being molded into fighting units. But true to the pattern of Canadian history, while many English Canadians resented the superior attitude of the British, the French Canadians were often angry about the poor treatment they received from their English-speaking countrymen. At the beginning in the Air Force, English Canadians were giving us a hard time. You know, the pea soup thing. Anyway, once our squadron was invited to the Duke of Gloucester's castle. He liked Canadians. A banquet with all the silver and the crystal. So we're starting to eat and my neighbors, English Canadians, don't know which knife to use and which spoon to take. Well, that was part of my education, so they had to watch me. And then, after the dinner, I saw this huge piano. Probably the biggest piano I've ever seen in my life. So, I sat down and I started to play Beethoven's Moonlight Sonata. You should have seen the expression on their faces. pilots were living near their base at a massive commandeered country estate called Beninborough Hall. This is for sergeant pilots? Oh, there's none of this here. Come on. It wasn't the rug. Come on. This is boarded up. Those pictures weren't here. My yeah. bed was just down here. Hey. This is for sergeant pilots? Well, we're all sergeants. Whole row of beds right here. But coming back in and looking, the vivid memory is in your cot sleeping. Maybe you're coming in off and off at uh, 3 o'clock, 4 o'clock in the morning, and you're going to go the next night. You didn't know that when you went to bed. But here's a, remember, that yeah. hand on your shoulder, wakey, wakey, sir. You're, you're on, on tonight. tonight. That's the way a normal day began for the air crews of Bomber Command. In the morning, their aircraft were fueled up and bombed up, more bombs usually meant a shorter flight ahead. Fewer bombs meant the target was further away. The mission required more fuel. As the crews headed off to their afternoon briefing, they would try to guess what the target was. Tension built as they entered the briefing room. Well, in our squadron, as you came in the back of the room, there were two curtains across, staggered, so that when you passed the first one, you could see the board and you could see the target. It was named right across the top of the board. And usually the person would see it, and if it was the ruler, the first remark would be, not again. Berlin, holy Christ. From the Canadian bomber bases in the north of England, it was a three-hour flight to the Ruhr Valley of Germany, and three hours back. The Ruhr was the main target area because it was the heartland of German industrial might. It was also the most heavily defended with anti-aircraft artillery and fighters. In the evening, the crews got dressed and headed out to their aircraft. An average of 20 planes would fly from each of the British airfields. They all had to leave England at approximately the same time and return at the same time. Taxiing and takeoffs all had to be accomplished in strict radio silence so that the Germans would not detect the exact hour of departure. 
You know, I can remember sitting here now, that first takeoff on a, to a target run, turning on to the end of the runway in the dark, in the rain, waiting for that green all this lamp to give you the signal, the crew already sitting there in their positions and, and starting this thing. And you start building the speed slowly, slowly, like a great lumbering truck. And then finally, with the stick forward as far as you can get it, to get the tail up, it's a tailwheel, and you've got to get the steering. And then finally, 60 miles an hour, 70, and you're watching the end of the runway and the trees just off it, in the dark, straining forward. Everything alert, you're watching that, but put the clock, the airspeed, and then finally 80, 85, 90. The engineer with his hands behind the throttle so they won't slip back. Finally, 100, and you're starting easing, easing back, because you don't want to jerk it off in case you'll stall, lose an engine, you're gone. The engineer's snapping the wheels up as soon as he can. You give him the order, wheels up, and then gets them up for you. And then finally, you got flying speed, and you start flying, and you can turn it. And the sweat is dripping down. Yeah, right down off to the house. Yeah. For the fully loaded bombers, it was a long, slow climb to cruising altitude. The navigator would chart the course. Soon the aircraft would rendezvous with the other bombers dispatched from other bases on the same mission. Sometimes 900 or 1,000 bombers would head out at the same time to the same target. It was called the stream. In minutes came the dreaded call on the intercom. Enemy coast ahead. The crew braced themselves First came the flak, anti-aircraft artillery fire. The explosion shook the plane. Then what was often the most feared obstacle, searchlights. The coast of Europe was lined with a thick band of searchlights and flak batteries, some of them radar controlled. When one light caught you, Dozens of other lights snapped over and trapped you in a cone. One of the beam picks us up, and the dark interior of the plane burst into brightness like a star. It's more devastating than being shot at. You have the feeling that everyone is watching you. Every gunner, every fighter has picked you out. To get out, we dive. Once we dived so hard, my nose was bleeding, my ears were bleeding from the pressure. the bomber stream returned to England. The bombers were still vulnerable to attack by German fighter squadrons all the way home. Many planes were badly shot up and limping back. Many had dead or badly wounded air crew on board. On one such plane was Canadian Jim Moffat. We were hit by a fighter, and the tail gunner and the wireless op were killed. The flight engineer, he was wounded bad, and our bomb load was hit. And these bombs, they're made with phosphorus, and this starts pouring out all over and catches fire. Well, this is like a big blowtorch. So the skipper, he puts it into a steep dive and he puts it out, and we head home. But we can't open the bomb doors to jettison the bombs out, and we can't get our wheels down. So as we're coming into the base, they say, okay, guys, head it out to sea, everybody bail out. Well, the skip says, we can't do that. We got wounded on board. I mean, you know, if he bails out and nobody finds him, he's gonna bleed to death. So they say, okay, give us a half hour and we'll put everybody into the air raid shelters. So we're flying around for, you know, who well, knows how long, and the siren's going and we're flying around this whole time. The flight engineer, he's passed out. Well, he comes to and he says, hey, what's going on? We tell him, you know, we're going in for a belly landing, and he says, what, the wheels won't come down? <laughs> and we say, no, you know, we can't get the hydraulics to, to, to work. And he says, it doesn't matter. All you got to do is cut the hydraulic pipe, and they'll come down on their own. <laughs> so we drag him over to it but he passes out when he gets her. 
He comes to, he passes out, he comes to. Finally, he tells us which one to cut. So we cut it, the wheels come down, the green lights come on, we land. The second we stop, poof, the whole thing goes up in flames again. Well, they douse us with the foam and they put it out. I guess nobody's ever come back with wounded in a really badly shot up plane before because, uh, well, normally when the plane gets hit, everybody bails out and the plane crashes. And, uh, well, they said it's too demoralizing. So they put the plane in the hangar and they wouldn't let anyone see it. Another crash I remember was when a Lancaster piled in. The turret broke off. Canadian gunner was in it. Just on the, this is right on your airfield? Right on our airfield. The turret rolled right across the airfield. The rest of the aircraft broke up very mm -hmm. badly. But this guy was still in the turret. We went over to it. We found that the guns were buried right in his body. We started to move things and he said, don't, for Christ's sake. I've only got a few minutes. And when he spoke, even though it was sort of garbled. Mm -hmm. Realized there's a Canadian, and I said, can we help? And he said, no, if you move anything, I'll die. So I said to him, where are you from? And he said, Ontario. But it's good to have with, be with a Canadian when I go. The airmen who were fortunate enough to survive such a crash were taken to a special burn unit at East Grinstead outside London, where horribly disfigured faces and bodies were rebuilt. These airmen were considered lucky because they at least survived their tour with Bomber Command. Most aircrew did not. of Tolthorpe in Yorkshire, a small monument in the town square commemorates the Canadian presence here during the war. On it you can just make out the motto of the Royal Canadian Air Force, per ardua ad astra, through adversity to the stars. The ruins of the nearby air base have been stubbornly preserved by residents like farmer and amateur historian Jeff Wood. You were 12 years old. Then. 12 years old at the end, yes, and it's things like this that keep the memory Right. living yeah. and uh, we pass it each day and uh, always think of those times when you were here. Some of the metal Air Force Nissan huts are still here. Today this one is used to store farm equipment. During the war it was used to store dead airmen. Uh, from the window to that end was the mortuary complete with its concrete slab and everything. I didn't know there was a mortuary on the base. Oh, where were you? The, the odds that were against you when you were flying? And, uh... Actually, as we learned later, I don't think I knew it then, the average life of a bomber could be six weeks. Yeah. So I was one in three survival rate. But did you know that at the time, or was that? No, you no, know, no, you never worried about it. Yeah. No. You wouldn't fly if you worried about it. No, that's right. Anyone who visited an air base like this during the war quickly found out that this kind of discussion on the topic of survival rates was closed down immediately and firmly. Freeman Dyson was a scientist working at Bomber Command headquarters and a brilliant analyst of the bombing campaign. I found the subject of survival rates taboo. The whole weight and authority of Air Force tradition was designed to discourage the individual airmen from figuring out the odds. Stringent precautions were taken to ensure that any of our command documents on survival rates should not reach the squadrons. Hey, Joe. Jim Moffat remembers that most air crew were pretty cocky about their chances, but survival rates were a quiet yeah, preoccupation. Hello, you know, I really miss those pink little knickers. Dolores, isn't it? <laughs> hey, in your dreams, Smitty. I think each guy in each crew really had one objective. 
to survive for that one tour, 30 missions. Used to be an above everything. After your magic 30, you were allowed to go home. News are bad news. We did it again. The last stop to Frankfurt, right on target. Bloody good. All right. We used to count those missions very carefully. And of course, the closer you got to 30, the tenser you got. Margaret. Some guys would be absolutely convinced they were going to buy it on number 28 or 29. Your head would just fill with crazy ideas. And you'd have to try and stay calm, keep it to yourself. Heading out on a mission, you'd talk about anything else. Boys, you should have been there the other day. You know, Jim here, we uh, killed the race track. On the first year I was in the squadron, I only remember 10 crews finishing. We used to think that experience counted for a lot, because most of the guys would be lost on number two or three. And then a bunch of guys would be lost between 25 and 30. And you wouldn't know what the hell to think. We had one squadron called Ghost Squadron, because during its first few months, only one crew survived the tour. I don't believe it. 1,500 pounds. 1,500 pounds. Once I got close to 10 missions, I started to feel pretty lucky. So I don't I think we, what, what do we pick? Five, seven, five, seven. Five out of seven races. It was, you know, it was unbelievable. Not that you didn't bet the same dollar. Not that I'd give up the regular safety routine. Standard ritual for tail gunners. That was for luck. I would never, never forget to do that. I only became a rear gunner after our first one got killed by a night fighter. I had a hard enough time getting into that turret. I was scared I'd never be able to get out of it. We were hit and going down. Mind you, the guys up front they have no picnic getting out either. They had to crawl over these spars, which was one thing when we weren't moving. Getting around in the plane in the dark in a panic wearing a parachute would be just about impossible. We all just had to pray that it wouldn't happen to us. The tail gunner had the lowest survival rate of all crew positions. Tail gunner was the first line of defense against enemy fighters and the first point of contact for their bullets. He was isolated from the rest of the crew and spent long cold hours alone searching the black sky. Mary Moore fell in love with the French Canadian tail gunner. He was a trapper with eyes like a cat at night. Pierre told me he'd never seen a train. Or seen a car. But he'd seen an airplane flying over and he wanted to fly. He trekked over miles to join up. We went swimming once and he taught me how to paddle like a beaver with my nose sticking up out of the water. <laughs> Pierre loved the wild. He knew how to cure thongs for snowshoes for long winter trips. For him, being a tail gunner was fighting off a pack of wolves from an overloaded sledge with the huskies tiring. He was infinitely tragic. He figured the end would be like dying in a forest fire. It's like going to hell and coming back to paradise. 
Piccadilly Circus, warm pubs, the good times, you know. And then the next morning, back to hell. The fear, the flag, the searchlights. This for me is the worst part of it, the worst. It is to and from. Often, when we come back from a raid, I I'm sitting back there all alone and I, I just cried. I cry like a baby. I have to. That's the only way to get out of it. They left in the thin wind of the early evening. The faces in the little windows looking white and pinched. Trapper was the tail gunner. They said, bye, Bubbles. See you in the morning. I rose at dawn and on my way to the operations room, I heard above the skylarks the sound of a kite in trouble. The fire engines and ambulances line the tarmac as she came down, engines all ropey and wing drooping. See for Charlie. She slew off the runway and came to a stop like a big wounded bird. I ran over. The medics carried off men still in flying jackets. Round-toed boots sticking out the end of red blankets. Tail turret was gone. Skipper had a deep gash across his cheek. They had successfully bombed the target when the trapper called out, Three messy smits at three o'clock! He yelled, I got one, and there was a burst of gunfire, and the whole rear turret blew off. Trapper. Gone to eternity. On almost every mission, the members of the air crews lost close friends or colleagues from the squadron. The cumulative effect of being constantly surrounded by death, added to the incredible stresses of their own missions, began to take a psychological toll on the airmen of Bomber Command. There was no easy way out for the boys who cracked. The rules of command were designed to ensure that crewmen should consider transfer a fate worse than death. When a boy was transferred for mental reasons, the cause was recorded as lack of moral fiber. He was officially declared to be a coward. Well, that was a horrible system. Uh, these are your crewmates and your, your buddies and... Uh to be, you know, branded a coward when, when you knew they weren't. People can only stand so much stress. The harassment and humiliation of such men was an RAF policy. But some Canadians applied it with vigor. Marvin Fleming was a wing commander. They were just plain cowards. They'd be put into the digger for 21 days for start. The diggers a military jailhouse get up at 5 a.m., lights out at 7 p.m. These fellows had volunteered for the Air Force. They wanted the extra pay of air crew and so on, and they weren't willing to serve. I'd say, do you want to transfer to the Army with rifles and bayonets out of the frying pan into the fire? Some of them were so upset that they'd say, I don't care what you do with me, but I'm not going to fly again, period. So you'd say, okay. We don't need you around here. 
and they'd get kitted up, and away they'd go. You had to be tough. Get these people out of the way quickly, or else you'd infect a larger chunk of the population. The stigma of being declared LMF led many crew members to hide their overwhelming fear until it was too late. One terrible night in a thunderstorm over Germany, a member of Doug Harvey's crew cracked. And he started screaming at the top of his lungs in a terrified voice. It just, it just put the hair up in the back of everybody's neck. And he's screaming, turn back, turn back, we're going to be killed. And uh, I had enough time wrestling with the airplane trying to get the thing through the ice and St. Elmo's fire on the windscreen. And I sent the bomb ever back to hit him. But he got back there and uh, came on the intercom to say that Ray had gone. And I said to him, where's he gone? And he said, he's jumped out, the door's open. And he had bailed out in, uh, in sheer terror. The feeling of shame and humiliation would drive many men to an early grave. On the day he was declared LMF, one Canadian committed suicide. He hanged himself at his base. In the first four years of the war, Bomber Command seldom tried precision strikes against key industrial targets in Germany. The dams on the Ruhr River were a much celebrated exception. The dams provide power to run nearby factories and water to irrigate the surrounding farmland. In 1943, British Defense Headquarters thought it would be marvelous if these dams could be blown up. The mission became one of the most famous adventures of the Second World War. It was hailed as a spectacular success. It earned Canadian pilot Ken Brown a decoration for bravery. And yet, looking back on it now, he's not sure the mission was worth its terrible cost. In 1943, Bomber Command had a problem. The Royal Air Force had a reputation to uphold, a reputation for excellence, daring, and precision. The dropping of bombs from very high altitudes was not very glamorous or very effective. Most bombs missed their targets by miles. Most of them were falling in city streets and killing civilians. Bomber Command wanted to focus public attention on something that would create a much better impression than the haphazard bombing of cities. Along came just the ticket, a new weapon that could be called a smart bomb. It was a powerful depth charge that would bounce along the surface of the water and evade torpedo net defenses, perfect for attacking ships or perhaps even dams. The technique was invented by an eccentric scientist named Barnes Wallace, who cooked the whole thing up in his spare time. But I first started in my own garden using the family wash tub and firing little balls that size out of a catapult and found that they would jump off the surface of the water. Arthur Harris was skeptical. This is tripe of the wildest description. There are so many ifs and buts that there is not the smallest chance of it working. My boys' lives are too precious to be thrown away in this manner. But the public relations side benefits of the plan were undeniable, and so Harris was persuaded to give it a try. The mission was going to be very tricky, requiring low-altitude flying of heavy bombers at night. And so a new squadron was formed, drawing the best pilots from all of Bomber Command. The squadron leader was Guy Gibson, a perfectionist who set strict standards for his men. When the pilots first saw the new weapon demonstrated, they were swept up in the technical marvel of it. They saw why a low level was critical to the trajectory. And they noticed another key requirement, backspin bomb had to revolve backwards to correctly bounce and impact the target. The massive bomb was slung under a Lancaster along with an electric motor to rotate it. Now once it started rotating backwards, 
it skipped normally three times and then would hit the wall and roll down the wall and with a hydrostatic detonator would go off. It's very interesting that it would blow the water away, crack the wall, but the main force came from the water afterwards. For weeks, the squadron trained without any knowledge of what the target would be. Because the training was at night over water, the men thought they would be attacking a German battleship. We used to think that 500 feet was low level. On this particular squadron, they started us off at 150 feet. We we're really getting low, but when they asked us to start flying, at 60 feet at night over water. Believe me, this was a whole new experience. You had trees, you had high tension wires, you had all kinds of obstacles, even some balloons. And at that altitude, you can't really be sloppy in flying because if you drop the wing at 60 feet, it would be on the ground. The first target was to be the Mona Dam, a gigantic concrete wall 125 feet thick at its base protected by anti-aircraft guns mounted in its towers. The second target would be the Sorpa Dam, a more vital dam. It was also much thicker, reinforced with earth and stone. The huge earthen dam was obviously invulnerable to an attack by bouncing the bomb across the water. And so it was decided that the approach would have to be made sideways, coming in over this church steeple. That was Ken Brown's assignment dive down over the village into the valley below, release the bomb at low level to roll along the length of the dam, and then quickly pull up to escape the hills on the other side. I think most of the crews really felt it was a one-way ticket, and this is why. But no, no one was coming back from this raid? Not really. In fact, in this one, with so many things against you, low level, night, pylons, Right. trees, etc. You're on the top of the trees, that your chances of coming back were indeed much slimmer than a regular bombing crew. We went out on the bus going to the aircraft with two other crews. We were the last to get off the bus. My gunner, as we stepped off, stood there in the darkness with his parachuting under it and looking at them as they departed. And I said, come on, Mac. And he said, you know they're not coming back, don't you? And I said, yeah. Seventeen bombers took off for the dam's mission on the evening of May 16, 1943. The planes were so heavy, they could barely clear the hedge at the end of the runway. They flew at low level all the way to the target, 600 kilometers away. Ken Brown remembers the flight well. At one point, he found himself racing straight for the front door of this German castle. He pulled up just in time to clear the chimneys. When he got to the target area, he could make out the church steeple, but the rest of the valley and the earthen dam itself was covered in fog. Combination of darkness and fog made it almost impossible to make his bombing run. The famous 1954 movie, The Dam Busters, dramatized the attack on the other concrete dam, the Mona. Flak guns hit several planes. having trouble even finding the Sorpa Dam. So I chose to run right down 
90 degrees to face the dam. Uh -huh. And uh, after three runs, suddenly we damn near hit it, coming right in here. Suddenly we said, there it is! That was the first time you knew. That's the exactly. first time, exactly. Yeah. And in going around, we came and I got on the wrong side of it, the back side of it. Right here. Way yeah. down here. And of course, by the time I realized I was on the back side over the powerhouse, there was a very large hill in front of me. Right. And coming up that slope, my airspeed was dropping off like you wouldn't believe. Yeah. And of course, just as I started shuddering, I realized I was going to go in unless I made a, a stall turn. Well, you did a hell of a job to get it anywhere near here. And you put it on the target. Yeah. With an awful lot of luck. You had to have an awful lot of luck. You're talking more. Yeah. <laughs> That's what it's all about. Ken Brown made a direct hit on the Sorpa earthen dam. The villagers nearby saw the large splash of the explosion, but that was it. The dam did not give way in the least. Ken Brown's Lancaster returned to base at 5.30 in the morning. He was one of the lucky ones. Of the 17 attacking planes, nine were shot down. Nine of the best air crews in Bomber Command. We'd seen some go down on the way in, blowing up in the air, but we had no idea of the numbers until we got on the ground, and then it started to sink in. As much as we were devastated, Barnes Wallace was just beyond himself. He was elated for a moment, I am told, at the time of the bursting of the dams. But when he started to find out about the discovery of the losses, he began to cry. He didn't expect to have that sort of, of losing so many young men, as he put it. Fine young men. The attack was more costly to England than to Germany. But like many other such follies, it was a public relations triumph. The raid was portrayed as a gigantic success in Britain. It was a great morale booster. Wing Commander Gibson received the Victoria Cross. But the damage to Germany was nowhere near the predictions. There were almost 1,300 people killed in the flood most of them inmates of a prisoner of war camp just below the dam, Ukrainian women who had been enslaved by the Nazis. The damaged dams were quickly repaired, and steel production actually rose that year in the Ruhr Valley. The real success of the mission depended on the destruction of the Sorpa Dam but there was never a chance that the skipping depth charge could destroy this massive wall of earth and stone. It was a challenge, nor did we know the place was going to be covered with fog. Ken Brown won a conspicuous gallantry medal for the dam's raid, but lost many close friends that night. Now he wonders why an attempt was even made to knock out the Sorpa Dam. So was the raid worth it, do you think? Not really, no. We should have had a weapon quite different. Because the weapon For this particular in, dam. For this particular dam. Yeah. Yeah. The Moyna Dam, a different building altogether, right. construction altogether, I should yeah. say. It may have worked well there and did, but on this construction it was really almost useless. The real lesson that could have been taken from the dam's raid is that the precise bombing of industrial targets was possible. The appropriate bomb for the job, the 12,000-pound Tallboy, was eventually developed by Barnes Wallace. The scientists at Bomber Command came up with a method of delivering the bombs right onto industrial targets from five miles in the air, significantly reducing the risk to crews. But precision bombing didn't really interest the head of Bomber Command. He wanted to win the war single-handedly by destroying every city in Germany and the people in them. Killing civilians didn't bother Arthur Harris. 
A policeman stopped me speeding. Said, sir, you could have killed someone. I said, young man, I kill thousands of people every night. In the second half of the bomber war, Harris would turn the killing of thousands of people every night into a science, but his air crews would pay the price for his obsession. Reports from the Air Ministry late this evening give a fuller picture of last night's air raid on Berlin the heaviest ever carried out on the capital, and one which coincides This Lancaster bomber mounted on the Toronto waterfront is one of the few memorials in Canada to the thousands of Canadians who served in Bomber Command. The Lancaster was the main weapon of the bomber war. It was an efficient killing machine. It could fly for more than nine hours and carry up to 10 tons of bombs. Thousands of Canadian airmen were killed in these aircraft. Hundreds of thousands of Germans were killed by them. At the bomber bases in England in 1942, the arrival of the Lancaster was a major event. Look at that old Lank. Hey, look at the bird. And they dolled it up. Canadian pilots like Ken Brown and Doug Harvey remember it well. It'd be a Mark III. Airmen were happy that the Lancaster could fly higher and faster. Remember how big that bomb bay was? It used to look tremendous. Their commanders were happy because the Lancaster could carry far more bombs. At the time of the Lancaster's introduction, there was a change in policy in Bomber Command. Until then, the major targets had been German industry and military installations. The first hint the air crews had of a change was a sudden desperation to increase the amount of bombs that each plane could carry. To accommodate the increased weight of the bombs, the head of Bomber Command ordered the removal of much of the safety equipment shielding the crews. Harris wanted to put more and more bombs on the German targets. He started to take like this, the armor plate behind the head. Yeah, I'm just to protect the pilot. Yeah. This to protect the pilot's head. Harris ordered it out. There was a door halfway down the fuselage, oh, yeah. armor plated door. That went. The rest, there was a crew rest bed. If, if one of the crew got injured, that was taken out for weight and then he could put more bombs on. Harris had received new orders. From now on, he was free to deliberately target German civilians. We shall destroy Germany's will to fight. Now that we have the planes and crews, in 1943 and 1944, we shall drop one and a quarter million tons of bombs, render 25 million Germans homeless, kill 900,000, and seriously injure one million. Under this building in central London is a bunker where Winston Churchill often slept and gave his famous radio broadcasts. In June 1943, more than nine months after the secret decision to aim at civilians, Churchill was still pretending the targets were industrial and military. During the summer, our main attack is upon that mainspring of German war industry, the Ruhr. And there is no industrial or military targets in Germany that what will not receive exterminating support. Air Chief Sir Charles Portal originated the real policy to intentionally kill civilians. Portal wrote in his secret memo of October 1942 that it should be quite clear the aiming point should be built up neighborhoods, not, he emphasized, aircraft factories or dockyards. Central map room, duty officer speaking. Oh my God. This is where it all happened. Look at the telephones. The lives of Canadian airmen were drastically affected by the decisions made in this British command bunker. But the Canadian government was never consulted, never even advised of the secret decision to start targeting German civilians. 
Bomber pilots like Ken Brown and Doug Harvey had no idea during the war that such a decision had been taken. Basically, we really thought we were putting out the German industry. And we were when we went into places like Essen, Krupps, that sort of thing. We really weren't aware of the strategy of trying to destroy the German people or the will of the German people, as it was put. There was a thing called the morality of uh, altitude. There were no faces. There were no faces on the German fighter pilots. And there were no faces underneath us. The job was to go here, follow the ribbon down the map. When you got to the end of that ribbon, you opened your bomb bay and dumped the bombs. And I guess we were all just terrified we were going to get killed. Some crew members realized there must have been a change in bombing policy, like Canadian Jim Moffat. I can remember when it hit me that we were actually killing people. We were briefed to go and attack some rail yards, and they told us that the people from the city were trying to escape, and that's why we were attacking the rail yards. I mean, we knew that people were getting killed because of what we were doing. But, you know, accidentally. This was the first time it hit me. Bomber Command is really aiming to kill people. But it was another one of those things we didn't talk about. Everyone just focuses on doing their job, carrying out their orders, and surviving the mission. The target wasn't our decision. We just tried not to think about it. Hey guys, let's go. Sometimes Canadian pilots flying at low altitudes would get a vivid picture. All the night we raided Stettin, it was very clear. Very cold, clear night, snow on the ground. And uh, it just looked like a Christmas card scene down below. And I hadn't seen that before on a target. And you could see the houses and the factories and the buildings down below. And the flares went down, and we started, the bombs started going down. And we dropped our bombs and you could see the buildings going up, see the houses exploding and see the bombs going along the street erupting and uh, blackening the snow and it was a very uh, very disturbing for me because i hadn't seen uh, this happen before the uh, usually the uh, target was obscured and uh, you didn't get a good view of it but to watch those houses going and uh, to realize these were your bombs uh, well, it was a different kettle of fish for me Canadian wing commander Marvin Fleming. If it's an old city, mostly wooden buildings, we try and set fire to it. Go in with high explosives at first to blow up all the gas lines to get the thing going. And then put in the incendiaries in the second wave. Some of the incendiaries, the little four pounders, well, you can kick those out of the way. But we carry 250 of those per can, as we call them and then carry maybe six cans, so you have over a thousand of these per aircraft. On the night of July 24th, 1943, the air crews of Bomber Command were sent out in force with orders to destroy an entire city. The target was Hamburg. The mission was named for the biblical city destroyed by the wrath of God. Operation Gomorrah. The Battle of Hamburg could not be won in a single night. 10,000 tons of bombs will have to be dropped to complete the process of elimination. On the first wave, a large number of incendiaries are to be carried to saturate the fire services. The first wave of bombers attacked Hamburg just before midnight on July 24th, in the middle of a torrid summer heat wave. This is a terrible, uh storm that night, thunderstorms, huge uh, QNMs all over the place, lightning all over the place, St. Elmo's fire, a blue flame flashing on, dancing over your control columns across your window, and flacker pitch outside, big bolts of lightning hitting the sky. It was the first time we'd used window, this 
aluminum strips we threw out to fool German radar. The technique worked. The radar was fooled and the city of Hamburg was taken by surprise. The bombers dropped 9,000 tons of explosives over three days. Just as Harris planned it, the fire services were overwhelmed. Hans Brunswick was the fire chief in Hamburg at the time. It was a picture we could never have imagined. We had no experience with this. Buildings were quickly catching fire all around us. Some the ground floor, some the top floor, some in the middle. Flames were shooting out of the windows. It was an incredible shower of sparks which set fire to everything in their path. The wind was so strong that it simply swept people away and was only possible to move around by crawling along the ground. Trees standing around here were just flattened to the ground. What Hamburg was experiencing was a firestorm. Individual fires in many neighborhoods joined together into a single inferno, engulfing the whole city. The winds reached 200 kilometers an hour, the temperature 1,000 degrees. The fires drew oxygen so ferociously, the wind tore babies from mother's arms and sucked them into the fire. Forty-two thousand people were killed in the firestorm, thirty-five thousand of them in one night. It rendered nine hundred thousand people homeless. Die Toten lagen ja in der heißen Sommersonne und vor dessen Sitze die Verwesung. The dead lay in the hot summer sun and so began to decay very quickly. The smell. Within a few days, there were flies everywhere, black swarms of flies which covered everything. Then came a plague of rats, these horrible fat vermin running all over the place. They were eating the dead bodies, and there was absolutely nothing any of us could do about it. This plague of rats. In spite of all that happened at Hamburg, bombing proved a relatively humane method. There is no proof that most casualties were women and children. In fact, there is proof. The Germans kept very careful figures. For every 100 men killed in Hamburg, 160 women died. Of the 42,000 killed here, 8,400 were children. Most were crushed, asphyxiated, or roasted alive. I'd been in the Blitz in London. My bomb aimer in my first tour, his mother and his sister had both been killed in Nottingham by German bombs. They started it, they asked for it, and no, we don't feel very badly. Retired Fire Chief Hans Brunswick wanted to meet the Canadian pilots and show them some pictures he took of the aftermath of the bombing. One custom officer who died through heat. A customs officer. A customs officer. A customs officer. He didn't die from bombs. He was he he, he died from heat. 
ist ein Mann, eine Frau und ein kleiner Junge hier. A man, a woman and a little boy. Ein sechs, sechs Jahre alter Junge, auch, auch durch Überhitzung in ihrem Fahrzeug gestorben. They died uh, through heat in their car. Yeah, in their car. Mm -hmm. Das sind etwa 25 Personen gewesen, die haben hinter diesem Zaun Schutz gesucht. There's about 25 people who uh, <coughs> were searching for some protection behind the fence over there. It's a whole new gut-wrenching feeling that I've never had before to actually see the pictures uh, of the devastation here and knowing what these people had to put up with. They must have had one hell of a time. 55,000 people died in Hamburg during the entire war. 42,000 in that one firestorm. The dead were plowed into a common grave. Each large timber marks the victims of an entire neighborhood. Around the edges of the grave, some families have placed individual markers to remember their loved ones. After Hamburg, the Germans were determined to exact a far higher price from the bomber crews sent over Germany. And that they would do. Reunion of German fighter pilots in the Rhineland. Fifty years ago, they were young men with a mission to defend the German homeland from the Allied bomber crews they called terror flugen, terror flyers. They shot down Allied pilots by the score, many of them Canadian. And now they dance to that old Canadian favorite, Snowbird. When he was 25 years old, Martin Becker was one of the German aces. He has 58 kills to his credit. 58 Allied bombers with seven aircrew each. Ja, ich bin sehr gern gestartet. Ich habe das so als meine Pflicht aufgefasst. I was glad to do this job. I had taken it on as my duty and had no reservations. Die Hemmungen nachher any inhibitions that any of us had disappeared as soon as we looked at our cities burning on the ground. German fighter squadrons had bases all over Europe. They developed advanced radar to warn them when the bomber streams were approaching. They went after the Americans during the day the Canadians and the rest of the RAF at night. The lumbering bombers were easy prey. The Germans had a harder time finding the bombers at night until they developed a new secret weapon, tracking radar antennae fixed to the nose of their fighters. This radar would allow the fighters to close in for the kill at night completely undetected by the bombers. Then they would use another secret weapon, an upward firing gun called Schrag Musica, slanting music. Scientist Freeman Dyson tracked such developments from Bomber Command headquarters. A simple periscope gun sight was arranged so that the German fighter pilot could take careful aim as he flew quietly below the bomber's blind spot. The main problem for the fighter pilot was to avoid being hit by pieces of the exploding bomb. In spite of the horrendous losses his bomber squadrons were taking, Air Marshal Harris was determined to press home his attack against German cities. The Supreme Allied Command ordered Harris to redirect his attacks to precise military targets in preparation for Overlord, the planned Allied invasion of Europe. 
But Arthur Harris would have none of it. It is clear that the best and indeed only support we can give to Overlord is an intensification of attacks in Germany. If we attempt to substitute attacks on gun emplacements, beach defenses, communications or supply dumps, this would be an irremediable error and lead directly to disaster. In the end, Harris got his way. His campaign to destroy German cities would continue with a devastating cost to his own air crews. Bomber Harris came to, to Linton, our station, and both squadrons, 426, 408, and all the ground crew were all jammed into a hangar, I guess a thousand personnel. And this guy bounds up on the platform, we got to look at him, short, stocky, very alert, and he's, his first words were, um, most of you people won't be here in a few months. It got our full attention. We will produce in Germany by the 1st of April, 1944, a state of devastation in which surrender will be inevitable. Harris liked to pick targets of symbolic importance. Nuremberg was one of those. Hitler had called it the most German of German cities. It was the birthplace of the Third Reich, the scene of the massive night rallies glorified in Nazi propaganda films. So anxious was Harris to destroy Nuremberg that he scheduled the bombing mission there on a night with clear moonlight when crews would normally have been allowed to stand down. Harris was hoping that there would be enough cloud to hide his bomber stream, so a mosquito weather plane was dispatched to scout the German sky. The mosquito navigator was Canadian R.G. Dale. We took off at 20 minutes past noon. Our flight was 900 miles in three hours. They said it was important. Would the route to Nuremberg be covered with cloud? Would the target be clouded over? We had a bad feeling about this one. It was gonna be trip number 13 for our skipper. Unlucky 13. We were just praying the weather guys would tell them to cancel it. At 3.30 p.m., the weather plane returned from its mission. I went straight to the phone, a direct line to Bomber Command. All the group captains come on the line simultaneously at their bases. Now, I told them it was so clear we left a long vapor trail in the sky. The only place we saw high banks of clouds was over the target, Nuremberg. Some of Harris's advisors tried to talk him out of the mission. Thank you, gentlemen. In spite of everything, Harris was determined to press on. Got to do the same stuff as on the first trip. We came back safely. It's important. You can't change the luck. Almost every airman had a special lucky charm to protect him from fate. Jim Moffat was no exception was considered even more unlucky to have to take along a trainee pilot. Guys, listen up. This is Sergeant John Staten. He'll be flying second dicky with us tonight. Where are you from, John? Peterborough, Ontario. Are you? Toronto. Pat Kappa. Nice to meet you. Nuremberg, Jesus Christ. And a complete fucking moonlight, too. All right, guys, we'll have one hell of a pub crawl tomorrow night. On the evening of March 30th, 1944, the crew of aircraft W for Willie was one of 782 bombers preparing to depart for Nuremberg. Jim Moffat was in the tail turret. Lloyd Smith in the mid upper gun. As the crew started their Rolls-Royce Merlin engines, the sense of apprehension only increased. 
Many were still hoping for the sign to stand down, for the mission to be scrubbed. Instead, they were told to close the bomb doors and roll out to the runway. Some crew members distracted themselves with their jobs. Others say they started to pray for the first time in their lives. One pilot remembers repeating over and over to himself Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd. The stream this night was to be 68 miles long. It was designed to pass over Nuremberg in 17 minutes to concentrate the destructive power of the raid. It was dusk by the time the last bombers lifted into the sky. When the planes got above the clouds, though, and started to form up into the stream, all the air crews were struck by the same unfamiliar and unwelcome feeling. In the moonlight, they were fully exposed and vulnerable. Going south the river here, I could stretch up in my seat and look back over the length of the, of the Lancaster and could watch my turret. You, know, you couldn't see anything in a normal night. You couldn't even see a ribbon mm -hmm. on a wing, but you could see the whole airplane. Some navigators turned on their new H-2S radar, not realizing that instantly gave away their position to German fighter squadrons. Es war eine helle, helle fast Tag, helle Nacht. It was a very bright night, almost daylight. As we joined the other night fighters flying alongside the bomber's stream, we could see the first kills in the sky. We shifted into the stream and then shot down six bombers in a row. On Nuremberg, you could see everyone. The plumes of smoke, the contrails from your engines. Poof! They started shooting us down like geese. One guy, one German pilot, shoot down six of us. Just bang, bang, bang along here. It was the only time I was really frightened on a raid. I was damn near standing up on the rudder pedal. I'm sitting in my tailgun position, and I see the first Lancaster explode like a big fiery ball. And it's our job to call him out so the navigator, he can log him. Well, we're calling them out one after another. And then finally, Laird says, I don't want to hear any more, guys. So we stop calling them out. We just sit there and we watch them. 20 aircraft in 25 minutes. And that's just the ones we saw. Yeah, I can myself very well remember. I remember the first kill very well. He was very close to another bomber that was going down in flames. So from that light, I could see very well. I flew up to him a little lower on the right side and drove my attack home. I loaded my weapons, hit him, and he burned. We didn't wait around. The bomber stream was lit up by all the exploding aircraft. This is how we shot down one, two, three, four, five in a row. Actually, it was a nice shooting party for us. As bomber W for Willy approached Nuremberg, a German fighter appeared on its tail. The pilot banked the plane steeply and narrowly escaped. Finally, the target was visible, with colored target marker flares dropped from the Pathfinder aircraft in the lead. The bomb doors were opened. The bomb aimer stared down into the building inferno, and the crew held its breath. We dropped our bombs and said, let's get the hell out of here. We just put the nose down 300 miles per hour, closed the bomb doors, and Red Soder, the navigator, gave the heading to get home. We figured we'd made it. And after about half an hour, Soder says, I'm sorry, Skipper, I made a mistake. I don't 
don't know whether it was the winds or what, but we were off course. But we made the correction. Then every half hour or so, Laird would say, Keep your eyes peeled, guys. We don't want to hit another aircraft. shadow just crashes across, and I see it's a lank. Do you hear me? So, Anybody I call up to see if everything's all right, except my headset's dead. I can't hear anything. So I unhook to get up front to see what's happening, and my doors won't open. They're crumpled or something. So I sit down, and I thought, well, we've been in tough spots before. I'll just sit it out. And I see tail fins missing. I realized we've been in a spin this whole time, and the only reason why I didn't feel it because I was in the center of the centrifugal force. So I bail out. Except I'm being sucked down at the same speed of the plane, and all I got to kick off are the guns. Except I didn't put the guns on safety, so I'm going to shoot myself. So I don't have a choice. I kick off the guns. They don't go off. And my chute opens, and it swings four or five times, and I hit the ground. A few of the other guys got out, too. But, uh... Their chutes never opened. Of the 15 crew in the two colliding aircraft, only Jim Moffat survived. On the night of the Nuremberg Raid, 96 bombers failed to return. 545 airmen died. More airmen killed in one night than died during the entire Battle of Britain. Nuremberg was Arthur Harris's worst defeat, but in his memoirs, which go on at great length about his favorite raids like Hamburg, there is not a single mention of the Nuremberg Raid. His obsession with destroying German cities and civilians would continue to the end of the war. Heinz Bechert, Egon Blume, Dr. Dietrich. In Germany today, big military reunions are not that common. Many army and SS units get together only in secrecy. The German fighter squadrons, however, have never been reticent. They believe they have nothing to be ashamed of. In the closing stages of the war, the fighters earned the admiration even of some of their enemies like scientist Freeman Dyson. The night fighters and their supporting organization put up an astonishing performance, continuing to fight and cause us serious losses until their last airfield was overrun and Hitler's Germany ceased to exist. They ended the war morally undefeated. They had the advantage of knowing what they were fighting for, not in those last weeks of the war for Hitler, but for the preservation of what was left of their homes and families, their cities and their people. We had given them, at the end of the war, the one thing they lacked at the beginning, a clean cause to fight for. After Germany was finally defeated, many began to have second thoughts about the Allied bombing campaign, including some of the Allied airmen themselves. A Sunday afternoon cruise on the Rhine is a favorite outing for Germans. The reunion of German fighter pilots has decided to charter a boat. Tagging along are two unlikely visitors, their former Canadian enemies, Doug Harvey and Ken Brown. <laughs> Hello, 
The Canadians are in Germany meeting some of the people they bombed and some of the fighter pilots they fought against 50 years ago. And they find former German ace Wilhelm Suess, who well remembers the night of the Nuremberg raid. I know that exactly. I can tell you why. I wanted to go on leave on 2 o'clock in the night because I thought this night they will not come because of the moon. How many bombers did you get that night of the Nuremberg raid? Uh, four. Four. Yeah. A lot of German fighter pilots still have very mixed feelings about the task performed by their adversaries in bomber command. The bomber pilots are the real heroes, I'll tell you. My, my, my highest respect for the bomber pilots and bomber crews who fly two and three and four and five hours over Germany knowing that the, uh, the night fighters have the flag up uh, behind them. But you had to, to, to keep on track in the bomber stream. I, I would die. But uh, it was a great mistake of uh, thinking that you can destroy um, uh, uh, the, the, the morale of, of the population. My wife uh, is a half Jewish and she was living in Munich. As the bomb continued and was uh, uh, more and more, the resistance, resistance grew in the population, whether they liked Hitler or not. Oh, my name's Jim Brown. How do you do? I've heard about you. I've Martin Becker was a little apprehensive about meeting Canadian bombers, having shot down so many of them during the Nuremberg raid. I do. That's hardly is my name. That's hard. Nice to meet you. Do you have a chair? And a beer? Okay. Why not? Why not? Why not? <laughs> you know this guy. Were you on that, the Nuremberg? Doug Harvey discovers he's talking to the very man who shot down so many bombers that night as Harvey looked on. Right here. Somebody shoot down six. Bang, 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 bang. Really? Thank you. I'd never seen it before. It's not so secret to do here. Really? I would think he was the only man that saw you. I'd often wondered who this guy was to do it. And then to meet the guy years later who had done it. No, I, I don't have any uh, any feelings of bitterness. I had a job to do, and they did it, and they did it damn well. The pistol. That's a good time for us. Fifty years ago, they would have killed each other on sight. Now they toast the comradeship that can only be understood by veterans of the air war. Remember this place? Yeah, I remember Berlin. Yeah. I remember it 11 times, 11 nights. When I came into Berlin, you could see the searchlight 100 miles away. Yeah. If you had cloud, the reflection of the lights and the cloud were enormous. Yeah. A hundred acres, do you figure it's that much? Yep. Two hundred feet high. That's an awful lot of rubble. Yeah, that's an awful lot of buildings got smashed. The rubble of Berlin was pushed into one big pile on the outskirts of the city. It's now covered over with a park. It makes it hard to picture the damage and misery the bombs inflicted on German civilians. In Hamburg, these are the canals that were filled with charred bodies after the firestorm of July 1943. The memory is preserved with this sculpture at the Hamburg mass grave. It portrays the victims being carried across the mythological river of death. That horrible night became the central event in the lives of the people of Hamburg. They have lived with the sense of incalculable loss ever since. <laughs> Ursula Gildenmeister was 17 years old when she witnessed the fire from the suburbs of the city. Inga Einspenner was 16, and she was right in the middle of the inferno. 
like most residents of this city, they find it very painful to stir up the memories of that night. But they agreed to meet with the two Canadian bomber pilots to explain what it was like on the ground. It was no? at 12 o'clock p.m. Yes. It was daylight. From the fire? From the fire. I, fire. Oh, I, see. I seen people jump into the water because they were burning. Yes. When they came out, it was still burning. You know, it started all over again. Yeah. As and soon as they got back into the oxygen, into the air, the fire would start again? Yeah, yes. right. Oh, we see, I've seen many of them. I was so scared. I, I don't know where to go and, and what to do, you know. Yeah, well, we were dropping uh, fluorescent bombs, and these started the fires. And they yeah. were very difficult to put out. Yeah. About the only way that they uh, figured out was to cover them with sand, to cut off the oxygen, so they wouldn't burn anymore. But if you took the sand off them, they would continue burning. That's right. I've seen them because uh, I've seen a, a child goes on tar. You know what I mean? Yes. On yes. the ground. And uh, she was uh, uh, burning, you know, mm -hmm. from phosphor. And from, from, from the tar, she, she was sticking in the tar. She couldn't move. In the road? In the road, you know. And the mother who wanted to help her, I've seen it with my own eyes. The mother who would help her stuck too, you know. Couldn't she was sticking in, in yes. the tar. She couldn't help her child. So it burned, you both know, of both of them. You know, the mother started in the back and the child started from the bottom. No, and that's why she no. she couldn't uh, she couldn't get her child. So both of them burned to death. So I would like to uh, ask you, what do you feel now since you here, uh, since you've been here in Hamburg? Oh, it's been very uh, revealing for one thing and uh, terrifying in another way. You see, we were flying on uh, twenty thousand feet, seven thousand meters oh. above you. Oh, yeah. Uh, you, you don't see any faces, you don't see any people. No, 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 of course not. You were sent over to do a job. Mm. Um, and we were fighting Hitler, not the people of Germany. No, 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 no. Well... The Nazi. Sure. And he had to be taken out, this man. And the Nazis had to be taken out. Yeah. And this oh, was the way to get well, at them. Everybody said higher, you know, yes. at that time. Yes. You know, we were in... When we... I was you see, I was, I was 20 years old. I was only four years older than you. Yes. You know, as what my colleague was saying, we really weren't fighting people. We were fighting a cause. We only saw the photographs of the burnt buildings or the damaged buildings. We didn't see the faces of the no. people. You no. what nobody can blame each other now. And I am very happy we can stand here without aggression and nearly as normal people as friends, nearly, I should it's say. It's a pleasure, And that's, really. it's wonderful, I think. Gives us a greater appreciation of yes. really what you people had to contend with. But it is a, it is a very uh, touching feeling, I think, to stand here. Mm -hmm. I'm old now, so it's long ago and you are no young men any longer. But no, I'm afraid not. <laughs> I think it's very good. It's very good that we can speak to each other. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. The German victims of Bomber Command are estimated at 593,000. Most of them women and children. After the war was over, many airmen were overcome with doubts about the morality of the area bombing they took part in. Joseph Favreau. We must have killed a lot of people with those big bombs we had there. A lot of people were put away. It hurt us, you know. It will hurt me for the rest of my life because I think I have no right to kill those people. There is a widespread impression that I not only invented area bombing, 
but also insisted on carrying it out in the face of the natural reluctance to kill women and children that was felt by everyone else. The facts are otherwise. Such decisions of policy are not made by commanders-in-chief in the field, but by ministries, by the chief of staff's committee, and by the war cabinet. Because of area bombing, Harris was shunned after the war. He died bitter but unrepentant in 1984. At the beginning of the war, I was a follower of Gandhi, morally opposed to all violence. After a year of war, I retreated and said, unfortunately, it seems bombing is necessary to win the war, but I am morally opposed to bombing cities indiscriminately. When I arrived at Bomber Command and discovered we were bombing cities indiscriminately, I said, this is morally justified as it's helping win the war. A year later, I said, our bombing is not helping win the war, but at least I'm helping save the lives of bomber crews. In the last spring of the war, I had no excuses and had no moral position left. I don't feel that I did something wrong. I was trying to do the right thing, to destroy this man, Hitler. I wasn't thinking of people at all. I would, you know, a crazy thing that comes to my mind is the fact if we had had television in those days and the, uh, the satellite dishes that we have, that we come over and drop the bombs and then we can go home and watch it and see the people on the ground burning and their flesh burning off them, how many times we would have raided it. I think once would have been enough. I did 35 missions. When I came back home, my nervous system was shot. The streetcar bell would go ding, 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 and I would jump this high. At night, it was a scene from hell. Nightmares. I broke two teeth of my wife. Finally, I had to sleep alone on the floor. As for my crew, one's a drunk, one's on drugs. A third one got heavy shrapnel in his nether regions and will have a colostomy all his life. Another one fell from a turret ladder and shattered his back. And the last one got both legs shut off. After it was over, one day I was at Victoria Station. You know how youngsters buy up the old uniforms? Well, I saw this one in Air Force Blue with Canada written on his sleeve. The medals had gone, you could see where they'd been, but the wings were still there. I said to him, you're not a Canadian, are you? What are you doing wearing that uniform? He said, oh mess, it's just gear. I thought of all my lovely Canadians. who asked for tokens of affection on the edge of eternity. Why are we not taught more of the sadness of war? Of the 125,000 air crew who served in Bomber Command, almost half, 55,500, were killed. One in every five was a Canadian. And by population, Canada suffered the greatest loss. 9,919 pilots, navigators, flight engineers, bomb aimers, and gunners. 900 of those Canadians are buried here at the Commonwealth War Cemetery in Stoneful, Yorkshire. At the end of the war, fighter pilots were given a special campaign medal for their contribution to the war effort. 
bomber pilots were refused similar recognition, even though many more of them died in combat. They were treated as an embarrassment. They had been ordered into the skies over Germany to bomb cities, and then they were blamed for the civilian deaths that resulted. Duffy. Yeah? They had watched their close friends disappear by the score. There for the love of God go I. Hmm? 617? Yeah. Many felt guilty that they had survived when so many of their friends had not. That terrible August day. 21 years old, isn't too old. <laughs> None of us were.